The Bible is one of the most important historical documents that exists today. Within its pages are a multitude of ancient facts and scholarly details. Intriguing references to ancient technologies and phenomena, many of which are dismissed as exaggeration or believed to be impossible. But think again. Re-examination of the text may unlock the secrets to some of these mysteries. Was the famed Tower of Babel real? And could the Israelites have built it taller than anything on earth today? Could David have killed Goliath in precisely the way the Bible describes? Did the ancients discover a miracle technique that created fire from water? And could the Ark of the Covenant really have flown using a super science so mysterious it is only today being rediscovered? By recreating supernatural phenomena, using the latest technology, and by decoding the words of the Bible itself, the forgotten technologies of the Holy Land are re-examined. Ancient discoveries are investigating the lost science of the Bible. For thousands of years, the miracles described in the Holy Bible were taken to be genuine in every detail. But in modern times, the literal accuracy of the text has been questioned. Many believe that the stories are symbolic. The meanings are enshrined in truth, but the details are sometimes exaggerated or embellished. But maybe the words of the scriptures are more accurate than some now believe. Our ancestors had a surprisingly advanced understanding of science and the world around them. Ancient discoveries will use this knowledge not to prove or disprove the text, but to discover whether the fantastical details of the Bible are scientifically possible. It's a journey that begins literally at the height of ancient architecture. It was believed to be the largest building ever erected, a tower so high it may have reached heaven itself but the people who built it defied God. God saw what was happening. This was uh, an evil plan. It was not going to benefit society in the long run. So according to scripture, God intervened. People started to speak different languages. They started to argue with each other. And the disunity caused them eventually to uh, disperse and uh, the tower came crumbling down. It was called the Tower of Babel and some believe it really existed. Today, the world's tallest building, the Burj Dubai, is over 2,000 feet high. But what if science could show that the Tower of Babel could have been even taller? The Tower of Babel was just like one of the skyscrapers that we have today in our cities. You know, often the top of it is covered by cloud. They said it's so large it reaches heaven. Come, let us build ourselves a city with a tower that reaches to the heavens. Modern historians and archaeologists believe this story to be an exaggeration. But what if science could prove that the ancients really did have the technology to build such huge constructions? The key is to test ancient materials and architectural techniques to show their limit. Using information directly from the pages of the Bible itself, researchers will use modern science to calculate how high the ancient engineers really could have built. The story says that the, when they came to build the tower, they used the brick. So how tall could an ancient brick building have been? If one wanted to figure out how tall a building you could build with a brittle material like bricks, you can get a rough idea of this um, by calculating the weight of one brick and then figuring out how many bricks you could pile on before it starts uh, cracking uh, unacceptably and falls apart so your foundation starts crumbling. So the first step in this investigation is to reproduce an ancient brick. Lynn Hobbs is a professor of materials science at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. He is making a sun-baked brick out of clay, using the same technique as 3,000 years ago. Straw and sand are added, 
which binds the clay together, strengthening the resulting brick. The next stage is, is to dry it out. And the easiest way to dry it out is just leave it in the sun. And then the brick gets hard. To calculate the maximum height of a building made up entirely of these sun-baked bricks, you need to find out the strength of a single brick. To do this, Professor Hobbs is using an Instrom machine. This crushes the brick in a steel press until it breaks. The maximum load that this brick sustained was 800 pounds. And that's over two square inches. This is the crushing weight that a single brick can withstand vertically. So that means that a brick laid down could take 800 times 5 or 4,000 pounds. Each brick weighs one pound, so they can be piled 4,000 bricks high. So if we have 4,000 bricks, each an inch and a quarter high, that equals 500 feet. A 500-foot structure is as tall as the Washington Monument. But archaeological evidence suggests that the Tower of Babel could have been even taller. The story is set in ancient Mesopotamia, modern-day Iraq and Syria. A land that still today has ruins of ancient megastructures called ziggurats. Ziggurats were the skyscrapers of ancient Mesopotamia. On their tops, temples were built which were believed to be the dwelling place of the gods. The dozens that still stand today have been dated by archaeologists to be from the same era as the story of the Tower of Babel. They were created first around 2000 BC. The ziggurats still stand today because of their very strong pyramidal structure. Well, the ziggurats are part of a very ancient tradition, and so the people of ancient Iraq were very experienced in dealing with the materials for the platform. They understood that the increasing weight of these platforms needed spreading of the load. Buildings with a wide base, like the Great Pyramids at Giza, spread the load better than straight towers. This makes them more stable, therefore able to be built taller. A pyramid could be built three times higher than the tower. And if we take 500 feet and we multiply that by three, we could actually have a 1,500 foot pyramid built out of sun-baked brick. 1,500 feet is more than a quarter of a mile. That's pretty amazing for a bunch of clay that you've dug out of the ground. So using sun-baked bricks in a ziggurat shape, they could have built 1,500 feet high. That's more than the height of the world's tallest brick building today, the Chrysler Building. But amazingly, the Tower of Babel could have been even taller. There was a new and revolutionary technology so important, it is even mentioned in the pages of the Bible itself. They said to each other, come, let's make bricks and bake them thoroughly. That treatment of burning the brick changes its properties um, quite, quite drastically. It makes it much, much stronger. Firing the brick at 1,500 degrees Fahrenheit for 24 hours, like the Mesopotamians would have done, causes the clay particles to stick together. This results in a more consolidated and stronger material. But just how much stronger, and therefore how much higher, could the Tower of Babel have been, using this new technology of fired brick? The sun-baked brick failed with 800 pounds of weight. The fired brick should be much stronger. We already have a thousand pounds on the brick, much more than we had on the sun-dried brick. You can see it's starting to crack at about 2,000 pounds. Now we're up to 5,000, almost 6,000 pounds of strength. There we go. As you can see, it almost exploded. At 6,000 pounds, this means the fired brick is seven and a half times stronger than the sun-baked brick. Professor Hobbs is using these new results in the same calculation to find out just how high the ancient Mesopotamians could have built. That's two miles. 
So in principle, using fired brick, we could build a pyramid two miles high, well up into the heavens. Astonishingly, this is nearly five times higher than the world's tallest building today. So in theory, it is possible that the ancient Mesopotamians really could build into the heavens so high they would actually have suffered altitude sickness. But in practice, could they really have had the resources to do so? Even though theoretically we could have a two mile high ziggurat, it would have been impractical because the fire brick consumes so much energy to produce. We understand the story of the Tower of Babel to have actually happened. Just look at any skyscraper in, in a metropolis and uh, you'll see great towers reaching up to the heavens. Can modern analysis of biblical text also shed new light on one of the most famous stories ever told? That of the shepherd boy David who single-handedly killed the giant Goliath and revealed the weapon and technique deadly enough to bring down a giant in a single blow. It is one of the most famous underdog stories ever told. An attacking force armed with technologically superior weapons is led by a giant warrior feared by all. He is brought down by just a stone hurled by a boy named David. With a sling and a stone, David smote the Philistine giant. David not only defeated Goliath, but defeated the Philistines, and by defeating the Philistines was actually the uh, motivating force for the beginning of the history of Israel. How difficult would it have been for a boy to strike and kill a giant with just one accurate blow? The sling is the great ignored and underrated weapon of the ancient world. It's very cheap, it's the weapon of poor people, but it was incredibly effective. As two great armies stood facing each other on the edge of battle, why was a boy matched up against a giant? It was the 11th century BC, and the people of Israel were confronted by their enemies, the Philistines. The Philistines came from the area of the Aegean Islands, equipped with the most modern technological weapons against a very small, a minor nation. The Philistines' champion, Goliath, was covered in an armor of bronze. He had a tremendous amount of armor, which when we uh, actually weigh by the uh, that which is mentioned in the Bible to come close to 125 pounds so you see this unbelievably large monstrous creature when Goliath offered to settle the battle by a single combat David stepped forward but David was not just any boy he would become King David after Jesus his is the most complete biography in the Bible I think I think that David had a plan because, as he mentions to Saul, I can handle Goliath just as I have handled the bears and the wolves that have attacked my flock. My flock now is the Israelite army. My weapon is the slingshot. There is the wolf and the bear. Ancient discoveries will use modern technology and clues from the Bible itself to discover David's technique. First, we must find the perfect sling for one-to-one -one combat. The most advanced sling of ancient times was one that was adapted for extra power. This device I'm holding is called a staff sling, which is basically a sling which is attached to a long pole. This pole gives the slinger a greater reach and therefore greater power in every throw, which made it a favorite for heavier projectiles, like primitive bombs used like mortars on ancient battlefields. But would this have been the best sling for David to have used against Goliath? I think the idea that um, David could have used a, a staff sling is fairly unlikely. This isn't a particularly accurate weapon. The way I like to think of this is that the highly trained uh, hand sling throwers were more like a modern day sniper in that they were highly skilled, highly trained, and they could send a very small projectile with amazing accuracy. So David needed a hand sling. The kind of slings that are used in the Near East throughout the late Bronze Age are made pretty much like this. It's braided out of hemp. This is the sort of 
uh, projectile that was used in Judea, in Israel. Uh, you're looking for a very specific size and shape, a nice smooth oval shape. This improves the aerodynamic nature of the projectile, maximizing accuracy. You need a certain amount of weight to get the projectile to stay in the pouch of the sling happily. If it's too light, it will just fall out as you swing the sling back. If it's too heavy, it won't go as fast when you shoot it. So between those parameters is the ideal uh, sling stone. He chose five smooth stones from the stream and with his sling in his hand, approached the Philistine. Now we have a sling and a stone like the one David himself would have held, we can test this weapon's capabilities. Luis Pons Livermore is the slinging champion of the Balearic Islands, home for millennia to the world's greatest slingers. The Balearic Islands get this reputation of being the best slingers in the ancient world. They get an inherited expertise in using the sling. Luis has traveled to the Holy Land to test the destructive power of a replica Iron Age woolen sling and stone. He is investigating the exact technique David himself would have used to bring down Goliath. The sling is like an extension of the arm. It has three sections. One ring is here, and then there's the middle part where the stone goes. It ends in a knot here. You put your middle finger in here, and you hold it in a pinch, not a grip. The stone is put in the top part of it. You simply spin it three times, stretch your arm, and open your hand. The snap heard from a sling is a sonic boom. So much power is released that the end of the sling actually breaks the sound barrier. Luis has erected a nine-foot Goliath target, whose forehead is represented by a load cell, a device that measures impact. It is only 4.6 square inches in area, equivalent to the region of Goliath's forehead that was not protected by armor. The device will tell Luis just how much force would have hit Goliath's skull. So for a missile the size and shape of a sling bullet, how much force needs to be exerted in order to kill? If we're talking about how much force that is necessary to kill somebody by an impact to the brain, anything over 3,000 newtons spread over an area of 30 millimeters squared is enough to kill a human being. A shockwave goes through the brain and causes the brain to strike the inside of the brain case, irreversibly damaging the brain tissue uh, to such an extent that it, it couldn't work again. 3,000 newtons, or 3 kilonewtons, is equivalent to the force necessary to smash a concrete block in half. Luis readies his sling for the test. The target is tiny, equivalent to the only area of Goliath's forehead that was not protected by armor. Three point six two kilonewtons. That's sufficient to eliminate Goliath with a sling and a stone. Goliath is now dead. He slung it and struck the Philistine on the forehead. The stone sank into his forehead and he fell face down on the ground. But to have achieved this must have taken extraordinary skill and nerve. Even Luis, the world's foremost champion slinger today, has found it exceptionally difficult to obtain power and accuracy at the same time. To be able to take out an armored man with one sling stone is uh, a lucky or an incredibly skillful shot, even for a very skilled slinger. He must have been endowed with some tremendous skill, ability and capability that came to fore at the time of a crisis. And the fact that he was able to face a crisis successfully is one of the basic requirements for ultimate kingship. Ancient discoveries have revealed that it is possible for a mere boy to sling a stone so accurately that he could kill a distant target. But to do this, David would have been more skilled than the average shepherd boy in the arts of a warrior, or very lucky, or as the Bible suggests, truly blessed. Throughout the reign of King David, and still to this day, man has attempted to control fire. 
Could ancient documents reveal that the people of biblical times had a miraculous technique, a way to create fire as if from nowhere? One of the Bible's most mysterious wonders is the story of an altar of stone and wood described in 1 Kings. The altar burst into a fiery inferno, but amazingly no spark was used to ignite it. The flame appeared to spring from nothing. Analysis of accounts by some of the greatest historians of the ancient world could shed new light on this biblical puzzle. They describe a mysterious man-made chemical that would burst into flame without the need for sparks or embers. It was called automatic fire. Automatic fire, as it sounds, is fire that seems to spontaneously ignite. They think of a lot of this is mysterious, supernatural, that there are magical powers at work. Ancient discoveries are investigating the secrets of automatic fire. The story begins nearly 3,000 years ago on Mount Carmel in Israel. According to the Bible, the Israelites had been rejecting Jehovah and worshipping Baal, the god of rain. Now there was only one priest of Jehovah remaining, the prophet Elijah. Elijah went before the people and said, If the Lord is God, follow him. But if Baal is God, follow him. But the people said nothing. He had to lay down the gauntlet and he said, Come on, bring your prophets of Baal and let's see who the real God is. So Elijah set them a challenge. He and the prophets of Baal would both build altars and call upon their gods to ignite them. He told the prophets of Baal, You build your altar, offer whatever prayers you want, and that's exactly what they did without any response. The prophets of Baal failed. No fire appeared. Now it was Elijah's turn. He built an altar out of wood. He got the people to dig a furrow going around to fill it with water. Fill four large jars with water and pour it on the offering and on the wood. Do it again, he said. Do it a third time. And then he prayed to God, save us, answer us our prayers fire came out from heaven and consumed the entire area. Elijah had won them back to a belief in God. Fire on an altar drenched with water. Is it possible the water itself somehow actually ignited the blaze? We're used to water putting out fires, but sometimes water can create a fire. What substance could they have had in the ancient world that would display such a supernatural quality? Documents written in Israel in 232 BC harbor clues about the mystical substance automatic fire. There's this man called Julius Africanus who lives in Jerusalem. He talks about this automatic fire. What it probably is, is a mixture of naphtha and sulfur and quicklime. Because this was such a potent thing, the recipes for automatic fire were always very, very closely guarded. And the secret remains hidden again for hundreds of years until in the first century AD the great Roman historians Pliny and Livy both write accounts of this magical mixture igniting with water. Using these accounts and the chemicals they describe ancient discoveries will attempt to relearn the secrets of automatic fire. Tim Gallagher is the head of chemistry at Bristol University England. He has been conducting experiments using only substances available in Elijah's time. We have three components, calcium oxide, quicklime, sulfur, and naphtha. These are the three components that are mentioned in the ancient texts. Sulfur and naphtha both occur naturally, and quicklime comes from burning limestone. We're going to try and create a fire by combining these components and adding water. The easiest way to start a fire with water is to have a reaction that generates a lot of heat. And in principle, that heat could then ignite something close by that's also flammable. Fires start when a flammable fuel is subjected to heat. When you mix water with quicklime, you generate a lot of heat. The reaction of water with quicklime is highly exothermic. An exothermic reaction is one that releases heat into the atmosphere. This happens because chemical bonds are being formed between the water and the calcium in the quicklime. And what I'm going to do now is cook an egg with the heat that's generated by the quicklime. 
over 500 degrees Fahrenheit now. I didn't think we would generate such a large amount of heat so quickly. If you can harness that heat in the presence of something that will ignite, then you have a way of generating fire with water. But what we don't have in here is anything that will catch fire. So Tim is going to redo this test in the presence of the two fuels, naphtha and sulfur, in the hope that these will ignite from the heat generated. But this experiment will be on a much larger scale. Tim has built a replica of Elijah's altar. So the altar is comprised of 12 large stones, which represented the 12 tribes of Israel. We've added all the quick lime into our little trench. Here we have pieces of rock sulfur. And then the last thing that we'll do, which is the last thing that Elijah did, Elijah poured 12 barrels of water onto his altar. We think that some of that water was naphtha. Naphtha looks just like water, pours just like water, and then we're going to try and ignite that with the heat we generate by adding water to quicklime. The quicklime and water need to raise the ambient temperature past 449 degrees Fahrenheit in order to ignite the sulfur. Once the sulfur is alight, the naphtha and the altar should burst into flame. In Tim's earlier laboratory test, the quicklime reaction reached 527 degrees Fahrenheit. So in theory, this experiment should succeed. But in practice, it hasn't been tried for thousands of years. It's catching. So it's igniting the naphtha. That will spread the fire. And you can see it now spreading through. And everything's coming from the quicklime end of the, the altar. So you can see now the fire is really beginning to build up. It doesn't prove that this is how Elijah created the fire. What it says is this is a possible way that you could have created the fire. The ancients knew about quicklime, they knew about the reaction between quicklime and water, they had naphtha available to them. So certainly this remains a possibility as a way that one could utilize that chemistry knowledge to create a fire using water. People thousands of years ago had an advanced understanding of substances and their reactions. But how they used this knowledge and how much secret wisdom remains lost to science will never be known. Another closely guarded secret of the time was that of one of the earliest biological weapons, a honey that was toxic and was used by ancient armies to poison the enemy. <coughs> Bees, wasps, and hornets strike fear into most of us. Even today, bees kill up to 100 people every year. And in biblical times, military leaders used this fear to terrify enemy armies. In the Bible, if you take all the references to bees, you will notice that some of them present bees as being a danger, as being even a lethal weapon in war. And I will send hornets before you, which shall drive out the Hivite, Canaanite and Hittite from before you. People develop all kinds of ways um, to use bees. They, they pack them into little clay pots, which are almost like hand grenades. Uh, they uh, attach whole hives to catapults and shoot them into cities. But in an ancient account by Greek historian Strabo lies evidence that this weapon was taken one step further. In 67 BC, something happened in the north of Turkey that is still not fully understood by historians. One of the strangest examples of bio-warfare was used against the Roman army. It involved a honey trap of an ingenious nature. There's hugely varied different forms of power struggles going on throughout Roman history. Uh, lots of kings who are very unhappy with their lot and try to rebel. One of these rebellions was led by King Mithridates. He was one of Rome's most successful enemies. He really gives the Romans quite some trouble. The Roman general, Pompey the Great, was charged with leading a large army against King Mithridates. After a year of battle, the two forces reached the shores of the Black Sea in northern Turkey. The Romans have the upper hand and Mithridates is retreating. What he does very cleverly, though, is he leaves in his path these pots of 
honey. Uh, the Romans advance, they come across what they think of as delightful little tributes from a fading enemy, eat the honey, but it turns out to be viciously toxic. Could this honey really have been a ready-made biological weapon? The soldiers go slightly crazy. It's as if they're, they're high, um, drunk, then very agitated, and then a lot of them throw up and have diarrhea, and then they get very, very high again and kind of rush around, and this lasts for about three days. Amazingly enough, the Bible itself might warn of this terrible bioweapon. Have you found honey? Eat only as much as you need, lest you be filled with it and vomit. How can a honey become toxic? The answer lies in the rhododendron bushes that cover the hillsides of northern Turkey. There are many examples in nature of, of toxins and uh, the rhododendron plant itself um, is capable of producing natural toxins. These toxins are called terpenoids and are found in the nectar collected by the bees. These terpenoids can become incorporated into the honey um, from the nectar that bees are gathering from the rhododendron plant. For a window into how honey intoxication by terpenoid affects the body, ancient discoveries have brought in a human guinea pig, former military officer David Shaw. He will be administered 15 fluid ounces of the terpenoid solution under medical supervision. I'm pretty anxious really. It's kind of a step into the unknown with this test. Uh, the side effects listed range from just mild dizziness and perspiration to vomiting and uh, coma. David will be overseen by Dr. Adam Cunliffe here at the Human Performance Laboratory at the University of Westminster in central London. He will be put through a test that will push his cardiovascular system and coordination to the limit. But he will carry out this test twice, once before and once after taking the terpenoid. Dave is running at 10 miles per hour for 10 minutes. The test will measure his heart rate and oxygen consumption at low levels of activity. Your heart rate here was 164 on average throughout that test. And we can also see your oxygen consumption, and that turned out to be about 3.8 liters per minute. And it's the oxygen which is required by the exercising muscle. So the harder you're working, the more oxygen you're going to be consuming. Dave is in peak physical fitness, just as the Roman soldiers would have been. His test results are above average, but what effect will the terpenoid have on his body? Terpenoid is highly toxic, and Dave is only able to do this under strict medical supervision. Do not try this at home. Really, we want to see if his performance is affected. Dave's looking a little bit unsteady on the treadmill. He's um, finding it difficult to keep in the center of the track. His heart rate's about 10 beats um, higher per minute than it was in the previous experiment, um, and his Respiratory exchange is quite a bit higher than it was on the previous test. His performance on the treadmill was significantly affected um, in a negative way. When we looked at his physiological data, we saw that he was working harder, running at the same speed. Any form of coordinated movement, as a battle would certainly involve, would be seriously affected. I had no control over uh, my cardiovascular system, and obviously the results show that I had, was greatly diminished. In essence, we could see it as an early application of a kind of chemical or biological approach to warfare in getting the opposing forces to actually ingest this toxic substance. Um, you could see it almost as a form of culinary Trojan horse. So the results suggest that toxic honey would work by confusing coordination and accelerating fatigue. The three squadrons of Pompey's army that found and ate the honey on that fateful day in 67 BC became violently ill. That night, the sick Romans, still suffering from the effects of the toxin, were annihilated by King Mithridates' army. War drove technology to develop in biblical times. But in making weapons, did the Israelites also discover a super science that would allow objects to levitate? The Ark of the Covenant, containing the Ten Commandments of God, was said to have been able to fly. Can modern research now show that this really was possible? Well, now the Ark is really levitating, hovering freely in the air. The most powerful religious object in the ancient world was the Ark of the Covenant. We call it the Mysterium a Tremendum. It is this tremendous mystery of divine power, all concentrated 
within a small architectural device. It was said to be able to levitate, to bear its own weight in thin air. It was there, moving by itself, supporting those who were carrying it. Could this phenomena have been divine power, or is there another explanation? Could the levitation have been achieved by lost technologies, technologies that only today are being rediscovered? Believers believe that God can do anything. And especially when it comes to the Holy Ark, which houses the Ten Commandments given by God to Moses on Mount Sinai. The Ark is mentioned in numerous books of the Bible, the Quran, and the Hebrew Torah. But the most mysterious story is that of Uzzah. We know from the first book of Samuel how in the days of King David, the time had come for the ark to come back home to Jerusalem. Oxen were pulling a wagon on which the ark was resting. Uzzah noticed that the oxen started to fall to the ground. He feared instinctively that the ark could fall. And so he put out his hand to steady the ark. And as soon as he did that, he dropped down dead. Why? Actually, the Ark didn't need an Uzzah or anybody else to steady it. God said to him, Uzzah, it bears those that carry it. Can it not certainly bear itself? God was powering that Ark forward. Yes, it was levitating through the air with that power coming from God. But can science offer an alternative theory? Modern scientists have uncovered a set of substances with mystical properties. They're called superconductors and could explain the miracle of levitation. Superconductivity is one of the great frontiers in, in, in physics. Superconductor expert Professor Tom Johansson at the University of Oslo, Norway is investigating the phenomenon of levitation by superconductor. I have a magnet here and uh, if this is in the vicinity of the superconductor, when I cool the superconductor, what is going to happen is that the superconductor recognizes that there is a magnetic field surrounding it, and it's going to react on that. These unique properties of a superconductor create an effect called stable levitation, but they only work under very specific conditions. There are many materials which are superconducting by itself, for instance, aluminum, lead, Many elements are superconducting. So the materials used to make superconductors were common in the ancient world. But you have to cool them far down in order to get those properties. Substances will only superconduct past a critical temperature. To raise this critical temperature, metals are combined into alloys. I have uh, here a piece of yttrium barium copper oxide. And this material has to be cooled below 91 Kelvin in order to get into the superconducting state. But this you can achieve very simply by uh, pouring in liquid nitrogen. 91 Kelvin is equivalent to minus 296 degrees Fahrenheit. I can take the magnet and bring it closer. But if I now put my hand back, it will stay in the air. Magnetic levitation by superconductivity. But how can the magnet oppose the force of gravity? James Dean, a specialist in creating three-dimensional schematics, is using technology specifically designed for ancient discoveries to investigate. Well, a superconductor is uh, cooled below its critical point. The way in which electricity flows within it changes. If we take the superconductor and we place it in the presence of a magnetic field, we can see that the field lines of the magnet are inducing a flow of electric charge within the superconductor. These currents form tornadoes of charge called vortices with the magnetic field passing through their core. If we zoom in and take a closer look you can see that the vortices of current that the magnetic field has induced are passing through any little tiny defects they can find in the superconductor. These defects pin the vortices and therefore the magnetic field in place. If we move the magnet we're moving the magnetic field with it, which means that the vortices are being dragged away from their pinned locations. So they're resisting this movement, and if we push it and pull it, we can see that it's, it's trying to pop back into place. In fact, we'll find that any force which tries to move the magnet, and thus the magnetic field, will be met by an opposing force, which tries to return it to the same location. 
And this is the key to stable levitation. The pinning of the magnetic field opposes the very force of gravity itself. So the magnet is locked in place because its magnetic field is locked in place and it levitates above the superconductor. If the superconductor is moved, the levitating magnet will follow it, flying at the same height along a plane. So the magnet not only levitates, it can also be moved stably through the air. But could the ancient Israelites have mastered such a science more than 3,000 years ago? Quite often when we look at ancient technology, we're amazed at the, the craftsmanship and the skill that goes into the production of objects. This was an age of highly sophisticated metallurgy. War across the ancient Middle East was fueling the fires of advancement. Smelting processes were being improved to produce better alloys for weapons. While making these alloys, could the ancient Israelites have discovered this super science? If this were the case, it would not be the first lost technology puzzling historians. Quite recently we were looking at Bronze Age spearheads and their amazingly fine castings and we were trying to find a modern foundry that could replicate these. They all had great problems in achieving anything near the quality that the ancient metal workers could do. Was the Ark of the Covenant also levitated by a lost technology? Ancient discoveries will put this to the test. Tom has built a model of the Ark and will push stable levitation to its limits. To levitate this Ark is quite a challenge because it is a large object and it's heavy and uh, that I've never done before. At the bottom plate I have attached four very strong magnets which are going to interact with the superconductors that you are seeing here and I have put the spacer in between so I have a gap between the arc and the superconductor when I will cool them down. Tom pours in liquid nitrogen to cool the superconductor to minus 320 degrees Fahrenheit. For the experiment to be successful, the four supporting blocks must be removed one by one until the arc's weight is supported only by the superconductors. Well, now the arc is really levitating about 50 millimeters above the superconductor, hovering freely in the air. If I touch it and try to push it to the side, it will oscillate by two or three millimeters. If I really press my hand, it's, I'm now pushing with a big force, and it's almost not moving down there. It could take much more weight. So superconductors can cause levitation. But could ancient man really have discovered this super science 3,000 years ago. The physics of magnetic levitation with superconductors is of course uh, part of uh, uh, the laws of nature and this has been like this forever. The discovery of superconductivity was totally accidental. It happens by accident even today. But there remains a mystery. How could ancient scientists have chilled the superconductors to temperatures hundreds of degrees below zero? It is possible they didn't need to they could have discovered materials that superconduct at room temperature. There is no fundamental physical principle which prevents room temperature superconductivity. It could be that people have not found this material, but we cannot say today that it's impossible. God works in different ways. And uh, sometimes you can have an extraordinary feat from heaven. Sometimes you have something which is within the laws of nature which takes place. Both come from God. The fact that the ark could move by itself is a testament to the greatness of God. It is not magic, but it's very fascinating physics. Modern science often helps to uh, substantiate details and facts that are in the Bible. There are details within modern science which are incompatible with the biblical account of uh, events. But often, actually, modern science can be an aid um, to strengthen our faith and to substantiate what's in the Bible. The mysteries of the Bible have intrigued scientists and historians for millennia. But the book also gives us clues. Clues to the ancient civilizations, cultures, and technologies of biblical times. Modern scholars have used this evidence to advance our knowledge of history 
to show that ancient man had mastered chemistry, metallurgy, and even biological weaponry, and had the technology to build into the heavens. Today, the modern world uses technology to bring an ancient world to life and reveals the lost science of the Bible.